Welcome back. So I have something rather different for this weekend. It's getting chilly and I thought mm, we might like a little something off the beaten path today. And as I say, it's all weekend. This is not one of those little tiny, I can do it all in one video projects. I am repacking my china. It was all out in the schoolhouse, packed away very safely as it turns out. The roof crashed in, the china is fine. There were, as you all know, a few little pieces that hadn't made it into the boxes and they were shattered, they were turned into jewelry, that jewelry was giveaways, but the majority of the china was carefully packed up in boxes and now what I'm doing is taking the things out of the boxes, repacking them uh, with a little more organization this time. In part, this is because I've acquired a few more pieces and also because there are some things that I think I am going to take out of the set. So when we come back, we are looking at Rose Medallion China. The china is all out of the schoolhouse, so back and forth, just like a shopping video. So the first thing I want to show you is kind of the scope of the project. So let's take a look. So what we have here is the overall project. As you can see, I'm in the schoolhouse, and this is my china. It's all been boxed up. Thank heaven for that because it was safely tucked off in a corner when the roof collapsed. So no damage to the china, at least nothing I've found so far. So this is where I am getting the china from. And we're going to start pulling some pieces so we can take a look at some of the markings. So that's what's going on. I have three large boxes of china plus a couple of smaller boxes and a few things that I've acquired recently that haven't made it into boxes. And it's about time it was all reorganized a little because it's going to be in there a while longer and because they're resuming work on the schoolhouse in two days. So I would very much like to have things packed away and organized knowing then it could be some time before I'm able to get back into those boxes again. So, started taking things out of the boxes. And this is a perfect opportunity to take a look at Rose Medallion China and start with some of the basics. So, I know we've done this in past videos, but not everybody's seen those videos. Regardless, we're going to do it again. So, for those of you who have seen the videos, just think of this as a little bit of a refresher course. This is classic rose medallion. And I'm glad I found this piece because, as you can see, I packed it away without cleaning it first. Um, not sure why I did that. Probably just to protect it until I got around to cleaning it. But that was rather sloppy of me. We have our medallion here. And remember... That is where Rose Medallion gets its name from. We've got the peonies, and rose means pink. It's not referring to the flowers. It's just the French word for pink. So the flowers here are, in fact, peonies. This is our medallion, and these are our panels. In Rose Medallion, the panels alternate between people and flowers. Now let's go over here. This is Rose Canton. In Rose Canton, we have our medallion, and the panels that are surrounding it 
are flowers. Now, you will often hear people say, well, if there are birds or butterflies, it doesn't count. No, it's people, not birds or butterflies, that makes a determination. So, when it's all flowers, floral designs, not people, it's Rose Canton. This is a, a rare piece. I, this may, in fact, be the only piece I have of rose mandarin. Rose mandarin has the medallion, and if you'll notice, the panels are all people. And that's the difference. Medallion, people and flowers. Canton, flowers. Mandarin, people. And, as I said, that's how you tell them apart. For most practical purposes, all of these are going to be considered rose medallion, with the exception of the Famiel Rose piece. But, as I say, all of these are Famiel Rose anyway. So, I'm going to start pulling out some pieces, and we're going to take a look at some of the markings. Since this is my own set of china that has been acquired over time, and because with the exception of my tea service, it's all mismatched. It's whatever I like, what I have, what I'm using. In some cases, there were pieces that I just picked up because, you know, I, I just thought they would fill a need, you know, sort of plug a hole. On the theory that, well, maybe eventually I'll find something I like a little better or whatever. But it's a hodgepodge. The great thing about a hodgepodge is I've got just about every marking that you could want to see. So let's get back into markings and we'll start with some of the, uh, the most common markings. Okay, we've switched cameras again. And we've come over here. And I will show you this piece after I show the markings. It says YT Hong Kong. YT is the Japanese company that made the porcelain. And of course, Hong Kong is where the porcelain was decorated. Let's take a look at this. This is a rose, here, let's get that focused properly. This is a rose medallion soup bowl soup cup. Again, you see our people and our flowers, and it has a little lid. So, just, and this is how that would be served. A little bowl of soup with a little lid on top to keep it warm. So, as it turns out, we've got a couple of other markings right here. This one I already showed you, it's marked in Chinese, was not intended for export. This, right down here at the bottom, very faint, but you can see China. Now, the China marking is 1890 to 1919. Uh, again, the law tells us um, that's the date. So, let's take a look at his friend. There we go. Made in China. And again, 1919 to 1939. Now let's take a look at this little guy. Um, decorated in Hong Kong. This was our butterfly cup. It's a Demitasse cup, by the way. So... <coughs> When it says decorated in Hong Kong, what that means is the china was manufactured in Japan, shipped over to Hong Kong, and decorated there. That is post-World War II. We were not getting rose medallion or any kind of china out of China uh, from the period of about 1940 until relatively recent times. So, let's go find some more markings. All right, so one other thing I wanted to do 
while I was um, doing this kind of video. This is sort of uh, the way I video when I am out in the community, out in the world, at an antique shop or wherever, filming. But because I'm next door at the schoolhouse, I have the opportunity to do a little experimenting. I can stuff my pockets full of cameras, extra batteries, cell phones, etc. So I decided I was going to do a little experimenting. After the last time, when I went to Bedford, forgot my camera, and filmed on my cell phone, and realized I wasn't crazy about the image that we got from that, but the sound was great, I decided we'd try some different options. So, let's take a look at what we're using today. Now, over here, what you see is my still camera. This is my, my old digital camera that's probably about 20 years old. It takes great still pictures, but it takes video, and there are a couple of extra batteries, plus two cell phones. So the reason for the cell phones is the last time I was out shopping at Bedford, forgot my camera, I had to film with a cell phone. And actually, even though I wasn't thrilled about the picture, the sound was very good. So we're going to do a little experimenting when I start filming this, and I'm going to try some different cell phones, um, the, the old camera, as well as this one. This is the fancy Lala Nikon that doesn't have great sound quality. So we're going to switch it up a little. Review, but I did want an opportunity to talk about some particular kinds of markings. And I chose Andrea by Sadek because I, I have some of those pieces. I also have some other pieces. And these are interesting because it's not just places like Andrea by Sadek. Uh, the major department stores, Neiman Marcus did this too. They actually commissioned pieces of rose medallion china. And people will look at that and say, well, it's not really rose medallion. I can understand both sides of that argument. If it did not legitimately come out of the artistic tradition of Asia, China or Japan or Hong Kong, wherever the pieces were being made and decorated, if this was strictly done to the specifications by a Western importer or a Western department store, is it really Rose Medallion or is it copies? And I'm not sure how to answer that. I think you can make a very good argument on both sides of that issue. Uh, it's clearly copies. There's no two ways around it. On the other hand, the porcelain that was made in the 20th century in China or Japan, either way, were it was mostly copies of earlier designs as well. They were not the slavish copies that you get from like the Andrea by Sadek or the Neiman Marcus pieces, wherein they said, this is the design, and you do not stray from this design, and this is what we are buying, and they have all kinds of quality controls to make sure that there is a, a regularity to the pieces. Well, for their audience, their market, like people in the U.S. wanting to buy matchy-matchy sets, that worked, but it did take out a lot of the individuality of the pieces. So I understand that. As I say, I, I can go back and forth. I can argue both sides of this issue because any modern piece of rose medallion china, no matter where it's made, no matter by whom it's made, it's going to be a copy. You know, if it's a slavish copy or, you know, a, um, a copy with a bit of artistic license, what does it matter? For me, 
I have my preference. You know, um, the Andrea Bystatic pieces are great. I will grab them if I can get a good buy. That's key. I need to get them at a very good price because I will not pay the kind of prices I would pay for genuine antique rose medallion. But if I can end up filling a gap in my China service with some Andrea Bysatic pieces or some Neiman Marcus pieces, I'll do it. If the price is right, that's fine. But always in the back of my mind is this notion that one day, if I can find the same sort of piece, older, in the real artistic tradition from China, I'm going to get it. So I think it's worth considering because especially for anyone who is looking to build up a nice set of China, you always have these issues. And although I did not get into it in this particular video because these pieces are in another box, I have some pieces that were sort of mass produced. Uh, Rose Medallion, Rose Canton, I, ooh, to tell you the truth, I can't remember which, but I have some mass produced pieces. And I'm not sure what these were made for. They could have even been restaurant wear for all I know. But I have them. They are filling gaps. At some point, I may replace them. I may not. But it's something to consider that if you want to go out and get yourself a full set of antique rose medallion china. Well, gee, Bill Gates, I'm glad you've got that kind of money. For me, I had to do it piece by piece, set by set, because I am not filthy, stinking rich. And that's what you have to be to amass a set of any kind of antique china. So if you want to gap fill a little, I'm doing it. Um, let's see, what is, oh, the bowls. That's what's coming up next. Uh, I just started to unpack. This is something. Every time I see a nice little bowl, I do grab it. As a consequence, I've got way too many nice little bowls. But let's take a look because they've got some interesting markings. I've grabbed two little bowls here. Rose medallion, we've got people and flowers. And another people and flowers rose medallion. So let's take a look at these marks. Now this one tells the whole story. PCT, that's the Japanese porcelain manufacturing company. The little bit of gilding on the bottom says Japanese porcelain. So no question about that. And then you see decorated in Hong Kong. Any piece like this, and regardless, this is um, this is AFC, another of the Japanese porcelain manufacturing companies. And if you take a close look at the somewhat muddy text, it will say Japanese porcelain decorated in Hong Kong. Both of these pieces are typical of the rose medallion porcelain that came out after the Second World War. Now, of course, during the Second World War, we were not getting anything. Obviously, we were at war with Japan. China was up to their eyeballs. They had been invaded by Japan. Their manufacturing was shot. They were in the middle of the communist revolution as well. It was things in China were not conducive to making porcelain for export. So when you see pieces like this, the previous iteration of pieces pretty much stopped at 1939 and didn't pick up again until the late 40s, early 50s. And at that point, because 
we no longer had a relationship with the Chinese government, and we were occupying Japan, the manufacturers switched over. However, the artisans who decorated it, many of them fled to Hong Kong, which is why you see Made in Japan decorated in Hong Kong. The markings that I show on these bowls are very common markings. And perhaps you'll notice there, there's um, a sort of system to it. It's the initials of a Japanese company. I think we had um, AFC, PCT, YF. The Japanese manufacturers uh, gave their company names, uh, assigned initials to their company names. No idea what these initials stand for. I suppose I could go look it up. Doesn't really matter because that's how the companies are known, by the initials. Um, and very often the initials were not even, they didn't even correspond to Japanese words. They were American versions of Japanese words. That's why I say it doesn't really matter because even the Japanese people that worked in the factories probably would not have recognized the markings that were going out on these pieces. They would have described the factory they worked at in the Japanese language, whereas because these pieces were going to be exported to the United States, the company name would have been translated into English. So you see them, you just need to kind of get to know them. But the most important thing is getting to know that formula. Um, a company, not always a company, usually a company that would have been identified by its initials. Porcelain is made in Japan. Decoration is in Hong Kong. So let's take a look at another one because the Japan Hong Kong pieces are not the only pieces of Rose Medallion that came out in the second half of the 20th century. Let's look at another one. Well, here is another interesting mark. Uh, that is Portuguese, and it says made in Macau. Macau also did some rose medallion china, not a lot. Pieces like this are rare because Macau did, as I say, some work, not a great deal, so it's not usual to find pieces made in Macau. The rarity gives it no real value. Um, it's just, if this is a piece you like, then you would treat it the same way um, for investment purposes as you would treat, here, let's grab one of these. This, which was made in Japan, um, this one made in Japan, this one, which I believe says decorated in Hong Kong, also made in Japan. You're looking at the same relative value. It's just that the mark makes this piece a little more rare. But this is a rarity without any appreciable collector or market value, just a point of interest. Yes, Macau. Now, Macau is very near Hong Kong, uh, and the population, like the population of Hong Kong, in the second half of the 20th century, largely consisted of people who had fled communist China to go into places like Macau, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong. So they had artisans there, people who had actually painted Rose Medallion China when they were back in China. There were not a lot of pieces. Macau did not have a large export porcelain industry, not the way the Japan porcelain companies with Hong Kong artisans decorating it did. That was a significant industry. Macau was much smaller. So you find fewer pieces with the Macau mark. 
it does not, and this is, I know this is totally counterintuitive, it is a very rare mark. There is no particular value ascribed to it, none. Um, a piece that's made in Macau, oh, and it was usually decorated in Macau as well, uh, sometimes decorated in Hong Kong, but ordinarily made in Macau, decorated in Macau, it will have the same value as a piece made in Japan, decorated in Hong Kong. Uh, so the rarity does not give it anything except a teeny little bit of, of cachet. I like the idea that I have uh, a Macau piece in my collection just because I collect the porcelain and I like, I like the different marks. But in terms of value, no. For me, keeping a Macau piece is just a weird little eccentricity. Would I pay more for it? Absolutely not. Would I advise you to pay more for it? Absolutely not. It's a curiosity more than anything else. So there is uh, another piece that I wanted to show you before we sort of get into the final phase and then break away. And this was just a gravy boat. This is a relatively new piece. I mean, relative to the age of some of my pieces. It's a 20th century piece, let me put it that way. Um, it's old, probably the first part of the 20th century. And it just gives you some idea of the quality. And that was one of the things I wanted you to take a look at. This was not an export piece. This was a piece that was going to stay in China. So just take a real good look at the delicacy of the design. This is a very heavy gravy boat, beautifully executed, um, extremely detailed. As I said, very heavy. And we have a mark in Chinese. Now, this is not a very old piece. It's antique, but it's not extremely old. The reason it has a Chinese mark is this was not intended for um, export to the United States. United States export pieces are required to have markings showing the country of origin. So we're going to take a look at a couple of these. Um, let's see. Here we go. This cup is part of my tea set. So it's not my full china set. Um, and as you can see, Rose Canton, by the way, if this were Rose Medallion, when you hold the cup like this with the handle to your right, you will see the people scene on the front. All rose medallion cups are set up like this. And then, of course, the flower scene will be on the back. This is the front side of a cup. And I'm going to go check and see if I can find a nice rose medallion cup to show you what I mean. But that is the way to tell. If you see a cup like this, you see the flower scene, you know it's rose canton. And... If you see a cup like this with the handle to your left, it could be Rose Canton or it could be Rose Medallion. Then, as I say, I'll go find a cup and show you in a minute. This is marked Made in Hong Kong. And my whole tea set was Hong Kong. Uh, the tea set uh, was probably manufactured in the 1950s. And I ended up one cup short, and I don't remember what happened, but eek, broken cup. Here is the replacement cup, and I'm going to set them down so that you can see the two cups together. Let's see where I can stick. There we go. All right. Here are the two cups together. It's not a perfect match, but it's a good match. And it took me probably two years to find this cup because 
my two set, unlike my regular china, is a fully matched set. So I didn't want a conspicuously oddball cup. And this is made in China. Now, made in China tells us uh, because of the, the laws that regulated these markings, that this is sometime between 1919 and 1939. Um, very specific timing on this. So, let's go see if we can find some other markings. As you can see, they kept the best for themselves. That was a a piece that would have remained in China. Um, would I pay more for a piece like that? You bet. Uh, and the reason I would is the quality of the, the design work, the execution, the artistry. Ooh, top notch. Um, and that's one of my favorite pieces. Not the most valuable among them, but just a favorite because of the exquisite workmanship. So, now we are going to take a look at the one box I finally managed to get unpacked. This is the only part of my china set that is fully matched, and this is my tea service. So, it looks like I managed to locate and unpack my tea set. This is the only portion of my china that actually matches. So, we've got the teapot here. We have a sugar bowl that's almost as big as the teapot. All I can say is this is not a diabetic-friendly tea set. We have the cream pitcher over here. Um, this is a serving plate of some sort. I'm thinking of it in terms of a cake plate. These are our sandwich plates, the saucers, and the cups. And as we already know, um, where are we? Here we go. This, the one that my thumb is on, is our mismatched cup. So, it serves for six. I do not drink tea, so why do I keep a tea set? Well, you never know when the queen is going to drop by, and I am not going to be humiliated with paper cups. So, there you go. This is one of the things I actually wanted to do in this project, was get my tea set unpacked and repacked all in the same box. Now, those of you who actually drink tea have already noticed there's something missing here. I do not have a waste bowl with this tea set, but I have a number of little bowls like this, and all I really need to do is figure out which one will be appropriate. So far, this is my leading candidate, but as I unpack the rest of the bowls, I'll see if I can find something that might be a better match. This is Rose Canton. So, Rose Medallion, like this bowl, are not going to go with this. So, I'm going to have to find something that is um, Rose Canton, a nice bowl, will go with these pieces. And remember, this tea set is not very old. This tea set is probably around 1950. Um, yeah, I would say around 1950. So, and we know this. Again, the markings, made in Hong Kong. Um, however, it does have one teacup that's 50 years older than the rest. But that is my next project as I start repacking. When I unpack the remaining boxes, I'm keeping my eyes out for something that has the potential to be a good waste bowl for this set. All right, we will get back to this later. So as you can see, my tea service is relatively modern. 
vintage, but not antique. This is probably from the 1950s. It was made in Japan, decorated in Hong Kong, Rose Canton, and it's just, I get a kick out of the fact that the missing cup, the replacement cup, turned out to be 50 years older than the rest of the set. Uh, the set itself is vintage. That one replacement cup is antique. And um, when you look at it, I'm sure you'll notice there are some differences. It was not a perfect match. One of the downsides of dealing with something like Rose Medallion China is if you lose one of your original pieces from your set, you are going to be very hard pressed to find a replacement. It took me a good two years to find that cup and I was looking. So what can I say? If, if you have Rose Medallion China and you have a nice match set, take very good care of it. Or, as you will see in future videos, do what I do, mix and match. It, it is, I will talk about that later, the, the virtues of mixing and matching. So let me just say, two years of looking around for a cup, and by the way, I paid, I think I paid about a third as much as I paid for the entire tea set just to get that one cup. So right there is one of the downsides of Matchy Matchy. All right, we are going to continue this because I want to give you a chance to see some of the different patterns, the way they are combined, and some of the different periods later. Also, let me know what you think about the various little cameras. Um, I do think, like I said, I think I found one that really worked for me. So, take care. I will see you all tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.